Regarding Men with Paul Elam, Janice Fiamingo, and Tom Golden. Episode 2, Raina Bobbitt and Amazon Studios. Welcome to Regarding Men, Episode 2 with Janice Fiamingo, Paul Elam, and Tom Golden. We got a barn burner for you today. Oh boy, it's on Lorena Bobbitt. You know, Amazon Studios is doing a special, a four-part special on Lorena Bobbitt, wanting to tell her side of the story. Hmm, what's wrong with this picture? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is that, you know, who is the most famous perpetrator of domestic violence in the United States history? I'd say that would have to be Lorena Bobbitt. And they want to do a, a, a story on her telling her side, the side of the perpetrator. Okay, and who is the United States' most famous victim of domestic violence? I think that would have to be John Bobbitt, and they're going to ignore him. Crazy stuff. So where do we go, guys? Oh, Lord, Tom. <laughs> um, this is a sort of a complicated story. Yes, I mean, it is. Because here you have two people who are, as I was saying earlier, I couldn't imagine a couple that deserved each other more yeah. uh, than these two. You have two people who were abusive. I think that as I look back on the record of all this, it was pretty well established that, that both of them were abusive. There was a mutual abuse in the relationship. Um, but before I get onto the Amazon, well, first I'm going to say Amazon doing a four-part series on domestic violence featuring Elena Bobbitt is like doing a series on financial advice with Bernie Madoff. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, that part, I don't care what John Wade Bobbitt did. That part of it is absolutely insane. It's crazy. It's like the left just feels licensed to pick the worst poster children for everything they want to do. Um, and I guess it's kind of an ingenious tactic in one way. I mean, if, if she can be a poster child for victimhood in domestic violence after severing her husband's penis, um, and by the way, uh, history of violence against her mother, she was arrested right. uh, for hitting her mother. Right. Um, and also acquitted, just as she was uh, about cutting off his penis. But it's, this whole story is just rooted in craziness from the beginning. Yes. Uh, but to take a, a, a look at it, I'm hard-pressed to feel too much empathy for Mr. Bobbitt. I mean, right. although having your, he, he didn't do anything apparently to deserve getting your penis cut off when um, <laughs> the police came after the incident. Her first words to them was that he never waited for me to orgasm. Right. That right. It wasn't, he raped me as she later alleged. It wasn't that he physically abused me. It was that he was sexually selfish. Right. And she had, and you'll find a link to it below, folks, she had disclosed to friends before the incident that if she ever suspected he was cheating, she would cut his penis off. Yep. And lo and behold, that's what happened. And apparently she lied about that in court. Um, but anyway, my bottom line on this is that this is more craziness from the left. Let's pick the least favorable person we possibly can and make them a poster child for the very wrong. I mean, a poster child for people in need of mental health services, yeah. I would yeah. buy that. Yeah. She's a sick woman, uh, yes. patently uh, emotionally disturbed. But a victim across the board, no, she's a violent perpetrator. Yes. Uh, she has been with members, two different members of her own family. So I'm sort mm. of disgusted with this. Mm. It's, it is really disgusting. Uh, it, to me, it, 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 it signifies the, uh, where we are in modern feminism in which, yeah, there's almost a, a gleeful, smug determination to rub everyone's faces in the fact that no matter what the woman has done, no matter what kind of horrific violence and utter lack of remorse or self-recognition that she displays, she can still be brought forward and celebrated as a as a you know brave survivor as you know a, both a victim 
and also a heroine, somebody who, I mean, the, like the language of the Amazon Prime advertisements are, and, uh, and of the director and the producer of this so-called documentary, they couldn't be more stock feminist and more divorced from reality if you tried to create a parody. They talk about how, uh, you, you had said this around, Tom, about how she you know, found strength through the scars that she had endured, you know, it is, it's parodic. Um, one of the, the, the uh, I wrote it down here so that I wouldn't forget, the, the, um, the producer said that, uh, where was it now, that this was her chance, oh yes, here it is. With this project, Lorena has a platform to tell her truth as well as engage in a critical conversation about gender dynamics, abuse, and her demand for justice. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. And her own um, you know, words about what she experienced, the utter, um, like she's never had a moment of remorse. She's still angry at Howard Stern that he dared to say to mock her and to say that he didn't believe her the story that she told on the witness stand. She's so firmly grounded in this, you know, narrative of pure victimhood and therefore utter lack of responsibility for anything that she's ever done that she does imagine herself as a champion for, you know, irony of ironies, victims of domestic violence. Yes. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's beyond words. I don't know what to say about it. And, and it, it's, it's doubly horrific in the sense, I mean, we don't have to dwell on, you know, what would happen if this were all reversed, if there was a man who had, you know, done something horrific to his wife jammed a, a knife up her vagina or something and right. then claimed that he'd abused and been abused and and then they make a four-part documentary talking about his pain and how he <laughs> went on you know, gain courage to become a champion of victims I mean of course it would never happen so it's not right. even worth talking about but if it did happen in some parallel universe you know there would just be expressions of outrage people would protest at the film I don't suppose anybody will protest when I don't know if it's already been shown. It's being shown at the Sundance Film Festival, I know, but uh, sometime I think, in yeah, this I think week, it's coming I guess, up. Coming up. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think anybody will object or stand up in the middle of it and shout boo or shame or anything, which I would love to do <laughs> if I were there. But, you know, it, it's, 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 it's just really remarkable the extent to which, um, yeah, the, the radical feminist left will go in rubbing our faces in their twisted version of reality. And the other thing I was going to say was that um, like the, the, um, the act of women mutilating their husbands or boyfriends, often um, purely out of revenge, and even, you know, state quite, quite overtly stated that they did this because they discovered that their husbands were being unfaithful. It's not all that uncommon. Uh, I haven't researched the subject extensively, but I read a couple of articles it is apparently quite common in Thailand to the extent that there are hmm. doctors that have to that have specialized in penis reattachment it's that common that, that wow. women will, will do this to their husbands if they discover that they've been unfaithful or, you know or if they discover or just suspect and um, I read one article but it was unsourced so I'm and it was in Vice magazine but it was talking about the history of you know so who knows but it was talking about the history of of women doing this to their partners and he claimed uh, in a very strange jokey gleeful article uh, that um, that there were a number of copycat um, mutilations huh. that were obviously inspired by the Lorena Bob Hobbit hmm. affair uh, in the in a couple of years following. So this is more common than we kind of generally recognize. And the very fact that there could be copycat mutilations and that now we're going to have a film that glorifies the act of this supposedly valiant, you know, survivor and, you know, <laughs> advocate for, uh, for victims is, I, I actually think, really quite terrifying. Yes. Uh, nauseating 
Yeah. It's just Let me say a, a couple of things in response to that. One, just to note for all, for all the guys that come into my comments on my videos and say, guys, go get yourself a woman in uh, Asia. Uh, mm. Please follow up and read about what's going on in Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> then consider uh, maybe perhaps another option. Uh, the other thing is that I also remember distinctly at the time that Argentinian feminists proclaimed at the time that uh, Lorena Bobbitt was on trial that, because <clears throat> I think she's of Argentinian descent, um, is that if she were found guilty, that they would cut the penises off of hundreds of men in retaliation. <clears throat> um, yeah. yeah. Um, and I'll dig that up and get it to you for the, for the links. I remember that uh, distinctly, though. Wow. I wanted to touch on something else, too, briefly about this. I mean, and again, I certainly have a lot of sympathy for anybody that gets their genitals mutilated. I mean, it's a horrific thing to have happened. But I remember feeling a lot of anger over all the jokes about this that yes. it was so i mean and some of them were admittedly somewhat funny i mean you look at even the name bob it a bob is a cut um yeah, I, and I all the water fountain banter and joking uh about what happened to this guy and then you look at the same time that so many of these jokes were coming from men and Two, you look at what, what John Wayne Bobbitt did himself afterward. He started a rock band, which he named Severed Parts, um, and then starred in two porn movies that showcased, trying to capitalize on what happened to him. And later on, he was arrested for petty thievery, uh, that sort of thing, did some time over it. Not a really sympathetic character. But the, the problem of the way society reacts to this, I've heard a lot of people characterize it as women or just feminists. It's not. Right. This is a, a right. deep bitterness toward men that's apparently innate in most of us. Oh, the whole culture has been inoculated with gynocentrism. I mean, it's like people don't even know it. It's an inoculation that happens before birth. And what happens is we end up only seeing one side, literally. You know, I call it the Mobius strip. You know, it's like feminism is like a Mobius strip. You got only one side. You go around and take your finger around. It's <laughs> just one side all the time. It's crazy. Even the research is just one side. I mean, you think researchers are like, they're going to look at both sides, right? No, these guys are horrible. I did a video one time on uh, domestic violence. I saw this, this, this research that said one in five men will commit or have, have been uh, violent towards their spouse. I thought, wow, how about that? Then I saw article after article in the media saying the same thing. One in five men do this. So I thought, well, that's crazy. So I wrote to the researcher and I said, you know, did you consider including men, male victims in your research? And he wrote me back. After a while, it took him a while. He wrote me back, and what he wrote back was fascinating. You know, he, he, we had a conversation. He was a nice guy. You know, we wrote back three or four times, and he explained why he only wanted to include women. And the explanations were so lame. But that's what he was thinking. That was his way of seeing things. This is a bright guy, you know, but he's only able to see a little bit. You know, one thing he says, as I'd like physicians to think about asking men about IPV, interpersonal violence, a place to start is from the traditional heterosexual model of women as victims and men as perpetrators. Eventually, physicians may get to a point where asking women about perpetration and men about victimization, the medical community is not there yet and may not be there for many years. That's the kind of thing he said. This is a researcher. <laughs> you know, It's like it's crazy. Yeah. Well, look at it this way, Tom. I mean, right dovetailing immediately off of that was my introduction to all this material to begin with. When I read Myth of Male Power back in 93, I yeah. worked at a treatment facility 
in which we assessed every woman who came through the door for whether she had been a victim of domestic violence. Right. And we assessed every man who came through the door for whether or not he had perpetrated domestic violence. Yes. And when, so in, in a mild defense of your researcher, when I brought that to our staff collectively and said, I got to ask you, why are we doing this? I mean, right. because I, I, at that point, I started asking my right. clients, and I had one of them at that time who at one point in the relationship, his wife had clobbered him on the head with a fireplace poker Ooh. while he was sleeping, resulting in 12 stitches on his head. And we didn't even, he, he'd been there two weeks. We didn't know about this, right? Until I asked. Right. And so right. I went to the staff and said, look, why aren't we assessing everybody for whether or not they're perpetrating violence or whether or not they're a victim of violence? And the entire staff instantly became furious with me. Huh. Uh, and these are people with PhDs and, right. and master's right. degrees. And they immediately like, oh, my God, like you just said, you know, you know, why don't we deny treatment to black people? That's all. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what I was saying. So it doesn't surprise me. You're no, scared, but that it's the same inoculation. Yeah, the same yeah. inoculation. You know, it's just it's everywhere, and you got to take a red pill in order to see it. Yeah. You know? yeah. In fact, you got to take a bunch yeah. of red pills to get there. The idea that harms to men simply don't matter, and in fact, are are in, you know in popular culture the source of gleefulness and joy. We all remember, of course, that that. Uh, disgusting episode of what was it called the talk i think where um what was her name marilyn osborne is that sharon osborne sharon oh, osborne oh, yeah oh. yeah you know which she talked about how how uh, i forget the word she used exactly she thought it was fantastic and this was a later case this was like i think a 2011 case of a california woman who um and i don't think she ever used the excuse of of uh, that she'd been abused, but she she drugged her husband, tied him to the bed, and cut off his penis, and and you know left him there on the bed um, in agony, and uh, and this was a source of a great deal of hilarity amongst the women on this talk show and the audience. I mean, there were guffaws, roars of laughter, right. giggles, right. related shrieks. Right. I mean. It, it's quite something. It should be looked at every day, I think, by, by people who, who don't believe that things are really that bad, yes. uh, who think it's confined to a small minority of radical feminists. Yes. Uh, you know, this kind yeah, of that was are. the case really? of Catherine Becker Q. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or Q Becker, maybe, I think it was. Um, One of those. <laughs> One of those. Yeah. Yeah, Kathy exactly. With the and, knife. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Kathy Becker, with the Becker. knife. Becker. And... and you know, and the idea that, that it, all a woman has to say is that she was abused in some way or that, right. you know, or that her husband was selfish, uh, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and and that, that provides a get out of jail free card. Quite literally, in the case of Lorena Bobbitt, of course, she ended up with 45 days in a, in a psychiatric institute after which she, you know, miraculously recovered and was released. Uh, and there was a famous Canadian case. This was a woman not anything to do with um, with, with cutting off a, a penis, but a woman who hired a hitman to kill her husband. Her name, uh, her last name was Doucette. Um, then she changed it. Oh, that, yeah, that was her maiden name. Oh, I can't remember her first name right now. Um, anyway, she, a uh, Nova Scotia woman whose husband wanted to divorce her. And so she hired a hitman to kill him. And fortunately, the um, person that she hired was actually an RCMP officer, oh. police officer. And uh, so she was brought to trial. It was thought that it was going to be an open and shut case. It was obvious that you know, she had indeed attempted to hire somebody to murder her husband. But then once she was on the stand, she did a Lorena Bobbitt, and she claimed that he'd been violent and abusive and that she feared her life and you know, all of that sort of thing. And there, you know, there was no evidence uh, whatsoever. She'd never, the police had never visited the home. You know, there were no reports of violence or anything like that over a 15-year marriage. But it was accepted. She was acquitted. The man, you know, <laughs> who was still alive said that everything that she'd charged him with was completely false. His only crime was wanting to divorce her. Um, 
And this case was appealed all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada because it was so outrageous. The Supreme Court uh, ultimately um, stayed the proceedings uh, on the grounds that she had already suffered enough. But she hadn't suffered at all. Right. The, the only suffering she endured was having to go through the trial. Oh, she and has a vagina. Her. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's really... It's crazy. Yeah. It's, 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 it's and the, quite my biggest horrible. beef is that the, the biggest beef is that this daggone um, TV show is going to do the same thing in spades. You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of, I mean, I'm almost sure that's what they're going to do just from reading the little, little blips they have before. It's just like they're going to do the same thing. They're going to, you know, it further inoculate our population mm -hmm. in thinking yeah. in a Mobius strip kind of way so we can only see one side of things. Yeah. Crazy. And the whole while, uh, the, the part to me that's really dangerous about this is that you have an active push to excuse, even to, you know, glorify and lionize women who commit heinous acts in the name of bringing attention to problems like domestic violence. Right. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, they are working so hard and actively on expanding the definition of what that violence is so that yes. any type of, of, you know, he didn't buy me something I wanted. Well, that's financial abuse, which is a emotional abuse, which is the same thing as physical abuse. It's okay to cut mm -hmm. his penis off. Right. That's mm -hmm. what we're dealing with here. That's it. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. a frightening scenario. It's crazy. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. crazy. Yeah. And that law has been passed in, in Ireland, I think maybe in the whole of the UK, mm. uh, to say that, yeah, psychological abuse, emotional abuse, all, you know, all of those. Any, anything you can say made you feel bad uh, <laughs> it counts, counts up there um, as, as domestic violence, for which men can be put in prison. Uh, and, uh, and for which obviously women can then turn around and, and commit horrific violence against men. It's, yeah. yeah. It's crazy. And you know, one of the things that strikes me about this case is that uh, Lorena Bobbitt, according to the court documents, has an IQ of 83. So she's you know, borderline. Mm -hmm. She is only a standard deviation above retarded. Right. You know, so... I think that plays into things too, because it, I'm sure you guys know that they have now correlated violence uh, mm -hmm. with IQ. Yeah. That the lower the IQ, the more chances you will be violent. And I think John Bobbitt may share that number with her too. I mean, judging from what he's done, he doesn't seem like he's a really bright guy. You know, one of the guys that uh, <laughs> they tried to get him to be a stand up comic. And, um, in trying to do this, they had to teach him lines for a seven minute routine, a seven minute routine. And the, the guy who was trying to teach him said, I teach him a, and then he'd get a, then I teach him B and he'd forget a, I teach him C and he'd forget B. He said he couldn't remember the lines. So that tells me, Hmm, you know, he may be up there with Lorena in this and you get two people in a relationship who are, have low IQ. The chance of violence goes up. You know, it's, nothing, it's something I've never heard people in domestic violence talk about. You know, that really IQ is so critical. And, and a part of what it's pulling us to do is to be able to teach people who have lower IQ how to deal with any kind of marital difficulty. Because, man, I mean, marital arguments come up like lightning. Boom! If you're not mm -hmm. pretty smart, what are you going to do? You're probably going to act out. You know, the bright ones can either turn it into something funny or to, to um, you know, walk away or apologize or do whatever. But the people who don't have intelligence, you know, they're really at risk. And I think both of these people were probably in that, that group, you know? And at the same time, you know, we've got loads of men on death row throughout the United States whose IQs are close to 70. Yes. Yeah, in fact, they did some research on the IQ in prisons, and they found that they, they test, I think they tested seven different sections in the prison. And they found that the lower the IQ, the more violence in the prison. The higher IQ, the less violence in the prison. I mean, they've even done research on violence and countries. 
and shown that countries with lower IQ tend to have more violence. Countries with higher IQ tend to have less violence. Makes yeah. sense to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but IQ is it's kind almost of almost like saying it's not gendered, Tom. <laughs> well, it's complicated. And it's not yeah. one sided. That's the point. You know, it's, this is not a simple kind of thing. This is really complicated stuff. Mm -hmm. And and the feminists are trying to make it into this thing about it's men bad, women good. Yeah. And I'm sure this documentary is gonna do the same daggone thing. Yeah. Well, I I'm sure that fits the <laughs> intellectual needs of a lot of feminists to be able to <laughs> yeah, their own model. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah, well that's the that is the um, the brilliance of feminism that it's very simple and you could it, it provides you with a ready-made template to apply to nearly any situation in life that will automatically win yes exactly it'll it, automatically uh, win because it's you know inoculated with the gynocentrism mm -hmm. it allows it, it, uh, any woman to oh sorry paul no i was just going to say at the same time that's the bane of the men's movement is that yeah. it's it, it requires so much nuance and uh, honest raw intelligence to even wrap your head around the concepts and understand what's going mm -hmm. on in yes. a sophisticated way versus you know one and one equals three and you're a, a hater if you disagree with me yes yeah you know i i say all the time that feminism is downhill you know everything yeah. they try and do it's like a downhill they just coast men's work it's uphill you got to struggle just to even get a little little fact in there, you know? Yeah, yeah. Ay, ay, yeah. Ay. yeah, there's just something so incredibly emotionally powerful about that narrative. I think all yes. you need is a couple yes. of stories that provoke a certain kind of reaction in Ooh. men, in women, women of, of, you know, of outrage, of a sense of injury and, and self-righteous indignation, and in men of this deep desire to, to protect, yes. to save, uh, and, you know, and once you've done that, the, the person is almost impervious to, yes. you know, any, any dose of reality. You know, Karen Strong told me the other day about this research that may be connected to what we're talking about. And it's where they took women's tears. They got these women who could cry and cry and cry, right? And sad tears, not, not onion tears, but sad tears. They put them in little vials, these tears. They soaked some little pads with these tears and put them on under men's noses and had them sniff these tears for a while. Then they tested them. Guess what they found? The men who sniffed the women's sad tears, testosterone went down. Mm. And sex drive went down. All because of the women's tears. And part of the constituency of those tears, apparently, is oxytocin. And oxytocin is an affiliative hormone. It makes you want to cuddle. It makes you want to come closer, right? And so when you pair the testosterone coming down with the possibility of oxytocin pushing him to want to help, I mean, that to me may be the first little link into gynocentrism, you know, because I'm sure there's more biological stuff out there that, that's because it's, it's automatic for men. Men do this automatically. They do it without thinking, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And who knows, that little piece may be the start of some connections that we can make biologically of why we do this. Why, why Amazon Studios does this thing. They do it because, you know, they're pushed to, to protect women. Yeah. It kind of shines a new light on drinking male tears, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. The other part of the research, have, have they done the opposite? Have they had women sniff? I don't think so. I, I was thinking about that. I was also thinking about separating them out and have the tears separated based on how attractive the woman is and see if that makes a difference, you know? Yeah. Uh, I would be interested in seeing what happens to women's sex drive when they encounter male tears. Mm -hmm. If there's a hormonal response in men um, and the, these neurochemicals are affected simply by, you know, whatever is in, in the tears, yeah. I would like to see what happens with women because, I mean, that's part of the the whole difficulty emotionally of sexual politics. Well, is that we have feminists <laughs> and as you dirty pigs, show us how you feel. <laughs> uh, you idiots show us how you feel. Yeah. You emotional incompetence. Show us how you feel. And then of course, the moment you show them how you feel run liner loser. <laughs> yeah. A, a reaction say, of, of such disgust. Yeah. Yes. If, 
if a male tear is brought on more female sexuality, you'd have a lot of crying men, you know? Yes, it would. Yes. But I, I, I bet all be crying. there would be some interesting results. <laughs> in that. Well, folks, yeah. should we move on to our recognitions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does, does anybody have anything else to add on Lorena Bobbitt and John Wayne? Oh, just that it's a sad saga, eh? Really sad. Yeah, yeah all, all around sad. Yeah, remarkable. Not sad. It's all yeah. around sad. Well, and we're witnessing the birth of another typical feminist hero. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Yeah. Standing ovation when she went on TV. She got a standing ovation from people. It's, I, it's unbelievable. You know, and the other one last thing I was going to say it was that part of the narrative that, uh, at least according to you know Amazon Prime, that that, that they're working within is that that she was um, you know somehow her pain and suffering were belittled and and sidelined <laughs> and even made the butt of jokes by a male dominated media again. But, I mean, I, I haven't done extensive research into what was going on in 1993. 1993 was already, you know, all feminism all the time. At the t in 1993, I, I was working at a shelter for abused women, and oh. I remember this yes. case and the reaction it prompted. Yes. And there was a heck of a lot of sympathy for Lorena Bobbitt. Yes. Uh, and, you know, partly as we've already said, and she was she was not the butt of jokes. It no. was husband who was the butt of jokes. So again, it's just a, this complete rewriting of reality in service of some crazy kind of now necessary feminist restitution. But in fact, this is just more of the same old story of sympathizing yes. with the violent woman and jeering at and mocking and belittling the male victim. Exactly. I had the same reaction when I saw that. I, th I thought she was the butt of jokes. Yes, I was... 40 when this happened it's like i heard a lot of the jokes and none of them were about lorena they were all about john man if you'd have made a joke about lorena bobbitt <laughs> as, a, as a potential rape victim because that was the accusation at the right. time he had raped her and he was mm. physically abusive if yeah. you had made a joke about that in any peer group you would have been ostracized yep oh, exactly. yep yes yeah but of jokes oh that's a joke that's a joke. Yeah. So, so onward. Onward. Um, Tom, we have, uh, or, or I was going to, I'll ask you about the other one. Janice, we have uh, somebody to designate for the accolades from the three of us for their, uh, what do we say, good deeds. Uh, yes. And we do that every time we do one of these talks. So who is it? So this week we are going to um, applaud Howard Stern. He was a voice who uh, was vocal and insistent that he did not believe Lorena. He did not believe her stories of abuse. She still holds a grudge against him to this day, apparently. So he, he receives our, our award this week for his good deed. And also specifically, that he raised money yes. for John, John's surgery. So yes. he did a, a good thing in that, we feel. Absolutely. A deserving man in that account. And Tom, now it's time <clears throat> for the flying puta. Bring her out. Bring uh, her out. Yes, let her fly across the screen. There she goes. Yeah. There she goes. <laughs> there she is. There she goes. Oh, <laughs> <my God. laughs> Who was it, Paul? <laughs> it was none other than Lorena Bobbitt herself. Oh. For cutting off the man of a uh, the penis of a man for, I think, and I think the evidence on record says, quite frankly, that she lied about her motives, uh, that she was feeling hurt and selfish, and in a fit of rage, she severed her husband's penis and threw it in a field and has never expressed one bit of remorse for doing so. Um, nothing contrite from her whatsoever. <clears throat> Excuse me, losing my voice here. Um, uh, but I think she's a deserving, deserving recipient of the Flying Puta. She's living a lie. The Flying Lorena. And she's whoring herself out to the DV industry mm -hmm. right now with a fake story. 
Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, for you guys, when you see this, Lorena Bobbitt is trending on Twitter right now. So if you tweet this discussion with her name somewhere in it, uh, that will go into that discussion for all the world to see. And we'd like to encourage you to do that. Amen. Mm -hmm. So we finished? A pause of silence. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Pause that refreshes. Must, must be time to wrap things up. And now we're going to do this uh, every week, right? Yeah. Have we decided That's to do it every week? Yeah. It was really great, the feedback we've gotten. And so it encouraged us to try and do it every week and just see what happens. So, And, and also to let everybody know, uh, we're aware of the concerns about Janice's feed. Yeah. Uh, she is in a, a slow internet zone. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to do our best. Uh, there are some measures we're going to be taking a direct wire into modem, so maybe a new, new camera, some other things to see if we can improve yeah. on this. Um, and hopefully, uh, before too long, we'll see some of that. But we ask in the meantime for your patience. I know you want to yeah. see her lovely face all the clearer, <laughs> and we would like you to be able to do that. And so would we. Absolutely. Yeah. Fair enough. So we finished? I think we're finished. All right. That's good. We'll see you next week, guys. Bye-bye. Y'all take care. Bye-bye. We'll see you.